with the next in the Fanzine Friday series. Today we're taking a look at the Palantir number no. 3 from 1981. Please stick around. I'm AZ Mountaineer and this is our channel, Old School Rules, where we celebrate the community of old school gamers and grognards who like classic RPGs, miniatures, magazines, and everything that goes with it. Each week on the Fanzine Friday series, I take a fanzine from my collection off the shelf for a closer look. Today, from May of 1981, we're taking a look at the Palantir number three. Hope you enjoy the video. We're back this week. We're taking a look at the Palantir number three. So we continue our look at this fanzine that was produced in the United Kingdom. This is the Bristol and Avon Dungeons and Dragons Association. BADA is the player group that um, produces it. Here's our cover. It's the size we're used to. This is um, not heavy stock, just regular sort of uh, goldenrod colored or yellow paper and then folded in half with one uh, one staple in the middle. A Tony Ellum, it appears, maybe has sort of ended up being the person responsible to sort of keep this organized because he, again, is the contact uh, point for your subscriptions or submissions or whatever you might wanna, want to provide. And he tells us that we have really cool cover uh, artwork here by uh, Colin Evans. So we finally have got somebody with um, some attribution credit. Sort of a very, very excellent art, I think. This Conan looking uh, figure, he's got like a hold of a werewolf. I, I think that he's um, in his hand, he's got some skulls underneath of him. Really cool drawing. We've got an, some new lettering for the Palantir this time, and then we've got, as I think last time I called it a crystal ball, but obviously it, it is a Palantir from Lord of the Rings. And they feature here on the on the front telling you that the Bacon, remember that's the Bristol and Avon Dungeons and Dragons Association's convention, um, has occurred at this point, and they've got the dungeon, the, the convention um, competition dungeon that was run at that event is here inside, and it's really good. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So anyway, I think that, that artwork's really, really good. This one is, is still a nice size, but not a lot in it because some of the articles are take up quite a number of pages. Um, the Dragon's Horde of New Magic Items, the editorial, which basically just says, thanks to Karen, whoever you are, um, for typing this up and for calling for the artwork and for everyone else who's been waiting so patiently. So again, this is dated May 1981. You'll recall issue two came out in 1980. And I was able to figure that out because the uh, convention was set to occur in June of that year and they gave the date and I was able to figure out what year it was based on the fact that it was on a Saturday. And so we had one, I think in 79, one in 80, and now 81, so it's taken a really long time in between, but the, again, pretty good content. So slow and steady, I guess, right? It's better than um, doing a whole bunch right away and burning out. We got Smash and Stab Part Two, which they told us would be here. This is the particular look at weapons and you know, in detail with drawings and talking about what they are and how they were used. Uh, an article on playing Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, this was a continuation again of some suggestions for early play for people who maybe aren't that experienced. The competition dungeon from Bacon to traveling, which is a an article about traveler. He said he was going to have a starport, but uh, there'd been some of those released in the meantime. So now he's got a planet, sort of a swamp world, uninhabited, but people have gone there because some of the vegetation. Uh, which the vegetation is sort of sentient and can be deadly and people will go there to harvest some of the, some of the vegetation can be harvested for uh, to be traded um, and then menagerie which is new monsters they just have one we'll talk about that just a few contributors this time tony who i said seems to be sort of the one in charge uh, dl brown and brian betts who had attributions before for articles are in here as well and then colin evans we know is the artist Dragon Sword are the new magical items. It's actually the very first thing in here. And so I like, I don't know who did this, but I like it as you recall me saying before, these are magic items that are both a benefit and potentially a negative, right? So there's a balance, something good, something bad. The Ring of Elven Wakefulness, on the one hand gives you an elf's 90% immunity to sleep and charm. On the other hand, um, you're totally immune to sleeping. And so now you're an insomniac. And so 90% um, chance that you won't be able to rest on any given night. And of course the DM gets to play with that, right? Because maybe, it, obviously spell casters can't get rest to regain spells. Um, other characters maybe have some negative effect on their, I don't know, their hit points or their die rolls or something because they're just constantly exhausted. And it is treated as a cursed item. You can't 
get it off unless you make a spell. They'll let you make a save versus spells to be able to remove it. I don't know. Maybe that's okay. Maybe you require a clerical remove curse. The next one is froggy boots. Boots made from the skin of a frog, specially enchanted, give you a jump spell, basically. And, um, and that's really good. But then after you utilize that power, you can't speak. You can only croak. And so unless you have speak with animals as a spell or an ability, you won't be able to understand anything the character is trying to communicate. And uh, anyway, I, I like it. It's, it's a nice little balance. And obviously that negative effect would be something you wouldn't know until the first time you used it, I don't think. Um, and, uh, and it lasts for a turn, right? The riveting. So, but maybe it's worth it for the jump. Um, anyway, cool item. He didn't say, I think, the same thing. I'd make it get a remove curse to get rid of it. The Shield of Chaos. This is a cool item. It's a tiny one-inch piece of metal. It has a word in, a ruin inscribed on it. When you speak the word, it, it expands to be a full-sized, he says, medium. Shield, it says it's um, plus two, and you can use it to defend against three opponents. The first time you hit correct successfully or you are missed because of your armor class, it, um, the enchantment wanes, and now it's a plus one shield, and it's a small shield, so you can only use it against two opponents. Next time you're successfully, you, you hit successfully, or you are missed in combat, it's, um, magic has been essentially used, and it wanes further. Now it's a normal shield, and it's um, basically buckler size. It can only be used against one opponent. And then the next time it'll shrink back down to one inch and now you've got to try and find it in combat and pick it up or you might obviously lose it. So it's kind of uh, interesting. Um, and then finally the Mace of Regeneration is plus two. It basically is an evil enchantment. So if you're, if you're evil, when you hit, you drain. Not only do they lose those hit points, but you gain them. Only if you're evil alignment. If you're neutral, you will absorb half of those as additional hit points. And if you're good, um, then you'll give hit points. So it'll do one hit point of damage, whatever you roll, right? It'll deem to have done one hit point of blunt damage, but all the additional from your die roll is added, taken from you and added to the person you tried to hit. So that'll be quite a cursed item if you accidentally pick that up as a good, uh, character, good alignment character. Um, they also have, by the way, the, the answers to the uh, crossword puzzle from last time, and I owe you all uh, a short video about that um, crossword puzzle. It was a lot of fun. So now we have Smash and Stab Part 2, Brian Betts, and he's basically just explaining what these different weapons are. So we've got the Partisan, which is basically this what looks like a sword at the end of a polearm, the Military Pick, a Quarrel, right, fired from a crossbow bolt, the Ransur, which is this tri-bladed polearm, uh, the scimitar. Then we have the sling. We don't know what the sling is. Um, a spear, the spep, spep, spetum, uh, which again is a tri-bladed weapon at the end of a sort of a polearm. The standard bastard sword, um, which of course was very, very popular. The broadsword, which is more of a um, cavalry cavalry sword the way he has it done the long sword here he talks about the long sword over time how it went from being a slashing weapon to adding the the need for a sharp point to penetrate armor and he does he has some good explanation for some of these about how the armor and the types of combat over time change the design of these weapons and then at the bottom we have these short swords which he says are you could also think of as really big daggers as well and the falchion thrown in there as well then the two-handed sword um, I was on a trip recently, and I was in, in Venice, and they're in this museum, they had all these medieval weapons in there, and there were these, these two-handed swords, man, I mean, they're they like 12 feet long, some of them, they're gigantic, um, but anyway, he talks about the, the two-handed sword and how it was utilized, uh, the trident and the volg, which is this sort of cleaver at the end of a polearm. So anyway, a good article, and remember back in the day, several people did something like this, whether it was a small booklet or... Um, articles to explain because a lot of these different weapons people didn't understand that much about them, what they were, how they were used, and I think it brought a little more um, interest and realism to the game. 
Now we have Playing Dungeons and Dragons Part 2, and this one is going to give you advice on spells. This is by D.L. Brown. Remember last time he told you about what equipment you should get for your low-level character. And now he talks about, uh, and he does point out like there was a mistake. I think he recommended thieves use bows, which I don't think they're allowed to use under AD&D. But anyway, so first level spells, which is a great topic and one I might do a video on at some point, talk about different spells and how to use them. But he says, here's the spells you should take as a magic user. Sleep, because it takes out a large number of low level opponents. Then magic missile, because it has good range and it always hits. And then burning hands. Those are his suggestions. He's like, no doubt. He's like, if for whatever reason you don't have any of those spells, um, he says, there are defensive spells like protection from evil and shield. He says, but you really should consider whether or not to basically just send this magic user off to study and roll a new character. He says, because if you don't have a good spell, he really sees the magic users as dead weight. In fact, he suggests your party should be at least three fighters and a cleric, and then maybe add a thief and a magic user. But he said, you know, the first one I'd get rid of is the thief and then the magic user. Um, because you need fighters at early levels. Now, that's true, but that's also sort of the the fun of the game to have the magic user who basically hides and the fighters know like I got to protect this guy because later on um, my magic user is going to be really powerful and, and an important part of the party so in any event he says there's some suggestions you know maybe you can figure out how to use ventriloquism to scare somebody unseen, unseen servant I like this idea he says my unseen servant distributes oil so either already lit on fire or that I'm gonna light on fire but the unseen servant can get the oil in a strategic location or on top of the monsters or whatever. You know, that's a good thought. Charm person, which I think a lot of people actually do like, and he points out it's pretty awkward to use in the middle of combat, um, but it has a lot of uses, especially if you meet one stronger monster perhaps, or in other ways you can use it and use that charmed person to maybe protect your magic user or even the whole party, depending on who it is. And then dancing lights, he says really just trying to scare low intelligence monsters away. Um, and again, he says, if you don't have any of these decent spells to start your character, scrap them, roll up a new character. Clerics, he says, conversely, and they do have good fighting ability, clerics do, you know, they, they are your defensive spell casters. So he's like, you need cure light wounds, take it once, take it twice, and then consider something else. Um, and he says, and if you can get it, then the next spell you want as a cleric is command because it's your only powerful offensive spell. And then, of course, if you're uh, an evil cleric, he says you don't need those cure spells because you're not going to cure anybody besides yourself. Um, maybe protection from evil, he says, is an alternate spell for clerics um, who don't, for whatever reason, have command. So those are his thoughts. Good thoughts, I think. And the, I like these articles that talk about, you know, give you some ideas about what to think about for creating low-level characters. The competition dungeon, which is what they ran at Bacon 2, uh, like this a lot. He talks a little bit about it. He talks about his thought process about making sure you have good challenges. Um, he gives you this, the, the scoring system that he used. They, they played for one hour each. Um, and then you had points to see who, got, who was your best player. And it was particular achievements. It was how far down into the dungeon you can get. Nobody made it to the fourth level of his dungeon. It's four levels um, in the time provided. You had achievements and, and, and so there were some gen, general achievements and then different people were given specific achievements and some of those this guy's um, might conflict with the another person's and so one person wants to find something one person wants to destroy it so that can make for some fun playing as well I thought anyway I thought it was very well thought out I thought it was um, I thought it was pretty good frankly I like it a lot um, all right, so here, here's the, and I like this too, the way he did his dungeon. Um, everything's right here. There's no separate page you need to look at. So he wrote right on his map what's in the room, anything special about it. All those annotations are right there in the map. So all you would need were these maps to run your, your dungeon. He's got some really clever, he's got a lot of ideas where you can go left or right, you know, and you would, you could maybe even look and see what's to the left or right and pick which opponent's better for your party, etc. Um, he's got some some things where it's like better left alone like you know you don't try and kill everything you see something unnecessary why would you try and fight that so that was really good here's the second level um, and again these levels are fairly short and he said even so you know parties one party I think never made it off the first level 
um, the next party, had, or two parties, I think, maybe got stuck on the second level, and one party got to the third level. Here's this third level. Like I said, very short and simple, uh, which reminds you, you know, you don't need 100 rooms to have a good adventure and have a good time. And here's the fourth level that nobody got to, which I don't know. There were lots of things you could do to be successful here in your major quest that would get you major points, but also a good chance of getting killed. That was a lot of fun. Um, and if you get a copy of this, I definitely recommend I would pull that out and, and run a session just for fun with my players and see how they would do on that. And then finally we've got the only one new monster, it's called the Wingy, sort of seems inspired by the Wizard of Oz. They come with nets and he's got a, the way he does it, if they can roll over a 16 with any bonus for their dexterity, they hit you with the net, then you get to make a roll, if you can roll over 17 with any dexterity bonus added, you can dive out of the way and avoid it. But then once you're hit, your only option would be to try and like cut your way out. And you've got to hit an armor class of zero to cut one of the cords of it. And then you've got to get so many cuts in order to make the hole big enough to crawl out. In the meantime, these things descend and they try to subdue you. Um, so anyway, I, I get it. Um, like I said, it's pretty clearly seems inspired by the Wizard of Oz. And uh, I guess they're okay addition. I don't, I don't mind them. I don't love them. That's it for the Palantir number three. It's a fairly short one this, this week, uh, but really good stuff. Love the dungeon. The artwork on the cover is fantastic. And again, this is a pretty solid one. They seem to only come out every so often, but when they do, it seems like it's got some pretty good stuff in it. That's it for this week. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend, everybody. And until next time, keep rolling 20s.